Hello, and welcome to Direct Human Control of Physically Interactive Robots. Uh, I'm Gray Thomas, and this talk uh, details some research that emerged from a background that was actually in uh, humanoid robots. So I started with multi-contact robots at IHMC, virtual humanoids getting in and out of cars. I moved to Texas. I worked on point foot bipeds. I got a fellowship with NASA. I worked on the compliant actuators of the Valkyrie robot. And at some point I realized that the work I've been doing with humanoid robots is closely applicable to the problems of exoskeletons. And when our lab got an exoskeleton project, I, I got involved. I started working on an arm exoskeleton platform to understand how the exoskeletons interact with the person. And ultimately, I was able to implement my strategies on a lower body uh, exoskeleton. And the approach I took and the approach I'm interested in today is how to use interactive robots to empower people with the strength of machines. And my vision for this has an industrial component where large machines offer uh, powerful assistance as people manipulate tools and manipulate the environment through the machine. So the machine is kind of like a window to the world where things appear lighter and you appear stronger relative to your environment. These can take a bunch of forms. In the middle, you see something that's kind of a tool with arms, but this could be also just a behavior that a, a existing stationary robot arm could do, or it could be a whole mech robo suit uh, strengthening you as you maneuver around your environment and do multi-armed manipulation and everything. Equal to that, there is a medical application of this. Millions of Americans suffer from uh, limb loss, and robots have the ability to compensate, allow people to control joints that they no longer have. And tens of millions of Americans have mobility disabilities, which could be potentially uh, ameliorated with a, a targeted joint assistance that could also be interpreted as a direct human control where the, the device infers your intent from your interaction with the world and then strengthens you as you do that. So there's a couple of engineering challenges in the way of this vision. Uh, in terms of sensing and design, there's uh, attachments to the human body which introduce uh, compliance due to soft flesh. There's difficulty coming up with the sensors that would would uh, have the right form factor to go between the human and the environment and properly understand the interaction forces. There's challenges in understanding how humans behave when they're in a feedback loop with a robot and also how to track their behavior as it changes over time. And then to put these all together, there's a, an existing problem in uh, integration of all these components and and how to set up the high level controller to make it all work. And today I'd like to start with the, the sensing uh, first. And to dive into that, if you have a, a robot, say for the joint strengthening application, and this robot connects to the human body in multiple places, um, and it's trying to strengthen the joint, it's ultimately gonna be applying forces to those multiple attachment points. And the soft flesh of the person is essentially a spring-like intermediary between where you can apply the force and where you want the force to be applied, which is really the bones, musculoskeletal system of the person. So because the soft flesh gets in the way, it influences uh, the frequency domain dynamics of the interaction. And this is a challenge that exoskeletons have to face in order to be stable when they interact with people. And another hard challenge about this is that human have a, humans have a strong preference for compliant shoes. And if you want to understand what the human's doing to the environment, you need to sense the interaction forces between the human and the environment. 
So there's this hard mechanical engineering problem of just finding a shoe that allows for good high quality six axis force torque sensing. So you can see how the person and the environment are interacting. My work on the Valkyrie robot has addressed a component of the uh, design challenge. Uh, but of course, it was for a different application. I was investigating the behavior of the series elastic joints on this robot. And series elastic actuators, by the way, are just normal motors with transmissions. And then they have a spring between the transmission and the main output. Or sometimes it's the, the spring is somewhere else. But essentially, what matters is that the spring can measure the whole torque that the, the joint is applying to the rest of the robot. Um, so the, the spring is kind of a deflection sensor. And in addition to being a deflection sensor, it also influences the dynamics of the robot. One of the big open questions when Valkyrie was being designed is what springs should go in the joints of the robot in order to allow it to perform all the tasks at once. It's basically understood that if you want to do a good job of controlling positions, a stiffer spring is useful. And if you want to do a good job of interacting with people or the environment softly, uh, a soft spring allows you to do a better job at controlling your interaction torques. I started addressing this problem from a simple model, and the model looks like this. It's a, it's a rotational model, but I draw it like a, a linear model here. Um, we have an inertia M and a spring K of S the spring rate K of S, I should say. And the torque across the spring is tau of S, and the output position is theta. The motor is driven by a motor torque tau of M, and the motor has its own position theta M. And if we imagine the uh, spring deflection as the difference between the output and the motor side angle, and the torque across the spring as the spring rate times that deflection, and we have these simple dynamics, the you know Newton's laws for uh, Newton's second law for um, mass times acceleration is the sum of torques on the motor. We have a simple model where the two torques are the inputs, and all of the position signals are treated as outputs. Now there's a little bit of cleverness already in defining the model this way. If you're familiar with series elastic actuators, you may have seen it with a second mass to represent the output, the thing that the, the actuator is driving. Um, I've left that out because it allows a simpler expression of what the series elastic actuator can actually do. Uh, but we'll get to that in a couple slides. The two main approaches to controlling series elastic actuators are both cascaded approaches, where one feedback is the inner loop. And an outer loop controls the overall behavior, assuming that that inner loop has done its job perfectly. In the impedance control case, the inner loop is wrapped around spring deflection times the spring rate, which is to say you are feeding back a torque error, a spring torque error. And you, you feed that back to the, the motor torque, and you assume that this low level controller can solve the problem of torque control. And then your outer loop feeds back the output position, has some kind of designated impedance behavior, some spring rate and damping K and B, and such that as the desired torque so that in theory, you're achieving the behavior of a spring and a damper. Now admittance controller is similar, but it's kind of flipped. On the inside, the admittance controller allows you to control a position motor position drawn here, but it, there's multiple ways you can do it in admittance control. And with a simple control loop around that motor position, it's assumed that you can set the desired motor position. And then the second outer loop, the admittance loop, feeds back a, a spring deflection converted again into spring torque. That's compared to a desired torque and then that goes into an admittance block, which tunes the desired behavior in almost the same way as the impedance does, but it's inverted. And then that set is the desired position. 
So the problem I was trying to solve is to relate the choice of the spring to the range of possible behaviors the actuator can achieve. But in both of these control loops, there's no clear limit on what K and B can be. And K and B here is supposed to be the output behavior. So it's kind of a problem with the cascaded approaches that they don't lend themselves to an analysis of the control limitations. And in one of my earlier papers at UT Austin, I studied how to lower the gains, uh, detune the inner loop of an impedance controller in order to make the impedance controller capable, capable of rendering stiffer behaviors than it otherwise would be. And what that means is that those gains conflict, like the idea of having a cascaded system where on the inside, it does a perfect job of torque control is kind of in conflict with what you need to do to get good position controller with an impedance structure. So to deal with that problem, I analyzed instead a full state feedback model where both the motor position and the spring deflection are allowed two gains at the same time. And this gave a relatively convenient expression for the final behavior relating the spring torque tau s and the output deflection theta s. It's a second order numerator, second order denominator polynomial fraction and the Laplace variable s. And this actually makes it quite convenient. If you look at the gains, B1, B2, K1, K2, both of these polynomials have enough expression in the gains to set the poles and zeros independently. There is a, a high level or high frequency behavior, I should say, that is not controllable though, and that is uh, in the limit where s approaches inf j infinity, um, you get the behavior of your natural spring in the end, which makes a lot of sense given the way we structured the model. So what this way of thinking about the control gains gives you is a filter design problem. And once you specify the two poles and the two zeros of this filter, you can convert that into gains and then you can expect your series elastic actuator to behave like that filter. But you can't just put those poles and zeros anywhere. There are limits. Um, one straightforward limit is that all of this feedback is implemented ultimately by a real uh, microcontroller, and those have time delays. And there is a Nyquist frequency associated with the update rate which you can use to approximate the time delay. And to avoid the numerator or denominator becoming unstable, you need to set the poles and the zeros well below the Nyquist frequency. Um, you might ask, why do we want the zeros to be stable zeros? I mean, left half plane zeros. That's because while this transfer function is currently set up to relate torque inputs to position outputs, you could easily look at the behavior of forced positions and, and the torque response to those forced positions, which you would also expect to be stable for this actuator. And that simply inverts the numerator and the denominator. So then if the numerator is unstable for one, then the denominator is unstable for the other, and that's an unstable system. Another important constraint is that this system will ultimately interface with the mechanical inertia of the output. And in our Bode plot here, we can see that output inertia as a 40 dB per decade drop off line in the magnitude plot. It's got negative 180 degree phase. And this will intersect the actuator compliance we're designing. And if we want to avoid a nearly oscillatory system, it makes a lot of sense for that line to intersect where our actuator is behaving kind of more like a damper than a spring. If, if we intersect a mass line and a spring line, we essentially get a spring mass oscillator. And that's not really the desired behavior most of the time. So those are two considerations. And the third one, most interesting, is passivity. So to avoid having the system be capable of generating energy into the environment, we need there to be a relationship between sinusoidal torque signals and sinusoidal velocity signals 
where those signals are never in, in phase such that energy would be generated by our actuator. And that resolves itself as a phase condition on this uh, integral admittance on this, on this transfer function between tau of s and theta. And the phase condition is that the phase needs to be between zero degrees and negative 180 degrees. So that can be accomplished so long as poles appear before zeros in the Bode plot. And that actually makes it seem uh, kind of simple. The, the most, the least compliant you can be, the most stiff, is to basically have poles and zeros near each other and have an essentially flat line. And the most compliant you can be is to put the two zeros near the Nyquist frequency and ride that line up. And then you can set your, your spring and your damper can get off of that inertia looking line. And that's kind of the range of uh, more compliant impedances you could, you could offer. And there's a, a cool trick if you're really ambitious, we could talk about you know, going beyond the passivity limits if we have time. So this project had some uh, other side benefits. Um, knowing this relationship between spring stiffness and closed loop ability to control uh, impedance was helpful in nonlinear spring optimization. You could relate the local stiffness of your nonlinear spring to the range of mechanical impedances it could render on the final system when it's done. We were also able to use it to provide safety guarantees for a strength amplification exo behavior on our test bed. We were able to use a, a simplified version of the limits to uh, derive limits for finger stiffness in tendon driven hands. And that actually won us a best paper award at ICRA 2017 in Singapore. And the approach to uh, impedance control also appeared in a proposal that got funded by uh, NSF CMMI for uh, controlling the open source leg to do uh, impedance behaviors that match the impedance profiles of, of real people. Now, speaking of proposals, there was another recently funded proposal that I was able to help work on, which is in modular powered orthoses. And this this concept of a, a challenge in sensing and design shows up there as well. Um, when we were experimenting with these uh, powered orthoses, we were able to see that our interface and the, the compl mechanical compliance between our interface and the person was affecting the range of allowable controllers we could use. If we wanted to do a uh, compensation of gravity, for example, we wanted to help the person squat, lift up their own weight. Um, there was a limit to how high that weight could be, what percentage of the weight the exoskeleton could help lift before it began to vibrate. And ultimately, that turned out to be related to this mechanical impedance, this uh, the, the stiffness of the connection between the person and the exoskeleton and higher stiffnesses allowed us to do more aggressive controllers. So my vision for future research in this direction is to tightly couple the design of these systems with control-based objectives for their performance. I'm imagining research in wide motors that don't need as much of a transmission ratio and lower the total reflected inertia that the human feels in the motor. I'm also interested in fundamental uh, sensing challenges like the design of compliant sensorized shoes. And maybe most interesting, I'm interested in changing the way we connect robots to people so that the final behavior allows for a higher bandwidth. And one example of this is the idea of using force distributing interfaces. On the left here, I'm showing kind of the way a traditional pad applies force naively over a wide area of the person. And typically these pads have their own compliance built in in order to make it more comfortable. 
And my alternative to this is to borrow the Whipple tree support structure idea from large telescopes and support each segment of an interface with a different part of a large three-dimensional linkage that distributes the, the total uh, pressure you're trying to put on the person equally over these, these pads. Moving on to uh, human modeling and estimation challenges. There's two main challenges going on in human modeling and estimation. First, the human needs to appear in a feedback loop with the exoskeleton. And this isn't just like the whole human, this is in particular the unintentional response of the human to the exoskeleton's behavior. This is the feedback that would make the the whole system become unstable, perhaps, if the uh, controller was tuned too aggressively. So an important open challenge is how to model humans as they appear in feedback loops, how to identify this behavior, how to find a bounded model of all the behaviors the human could be doing, all of it in order to, to guarantee some sense of safety when the human and the robot interact. And another important challenge is how to track human behavior as it changes in real time, because human behavior isn't stationary and humans have a lot of ways to modify their behavior, even behavior that wouldn't be obvious that they could change. For example, if you clench your fist, you can stiffen your elbow joint. You can stiffen your elbow joint in a way that affects elbow strength amplification controllers, as we found out. But to delve back into my uh, PhD research, I was addressing a, a challenge closely related to this modeling challenge for the human. I was interested in modeling robots. Um, in particular, I was interested in that idea of a bounded model and the idea of robust control. And my concept here was that in an ideal world, the hierarchical controller of a humanoid robot would be based on robust control. And each level of this controller would take guarantees from the level below it in order to provide guarantees to the level above it. This would make a tower of guarantees. And at the lowest level would be system identification. And that's where I planted my research. I was looking at how robust models come into existence. Where did they come from? I was a little disappointed, honestly, when I found out where the robust models come from. The robust model here is, is on the left. You've got y of s, that's your output, is p of s times u of s. Now, p of s times u of s, that's the normal transfer function model. That's not the interesting part. The term on the right represents the uncertainty, e of s delta j of s u of s. And that delta is the concept of uncertainty. What we know about delta is just a induced norm bound. So what this model is saying is that the output is basically the plant times the input plus some error that scales with the input. Now, the thing that I was frustrated with is that these matrices E of S and J of S, I mean, transfer function matrices, these didn't have a great origin story. These uh, were coming basically from the engineering insight. And I wanted them to come from data so that you could say, find the best model that fits your data, find the tightest model. So to draw an analogy here, your data that you get from system identification is like a scatter plot. And the traditional way of finding a robust model is to find the center of that scatter plot and call that the nominal model, and then draw a circle around that model. And that circle is drawn just large enough that it encompasses all the data. And my alternative to this was to instead start from the ellipse, start from the circle, allow that circle to get as close as possible to the data. And from the data, learn you know, whether it should be an off-center ellipse, how tilted it should be, how, how elongated it should be, the shape should come from the data. And then the nominal model is just whatever happens to be the center of the ellipse that best fits the data. To describe this more concretely, 
we have a system, P of S, and our system identification is allowed to, to generate inputs U of S and observe the measurements Y of S. And we collect a bunch of data from frequency domain experiments where we put in a sinusoidal input U of J omega, and we got out a sinusoidal output Y of J omega, which are both represented as phasers. And we also, of course, record the frequency. So we have a bunch of data that looks like that. And we parametrize our model using a set of orthonormal basis functions beta so that u prime is this vector of betas times the inputs. And we define our uncertain model structure as follows. Y of s is included in the set defined by a plus b delta c u prime of s for all possible deltas satisfying that two norm bound on delta. So our problem then is to find a, b, and c. And if we look at the structures here, b is a square matrix and c is a square matrix, both of those can be defined to be invertible. Now, my main contribution to this problem was that I found that this problem can be represented as a convex optimization problem. The problem of finding the optimal model could be represented convexly. And that means a lot from the point of view of someone who needs to find models quickly, efficiently, reliably. The difference between a convex optimization problem and a more general nonlinear optimization problem is that when you, when you think you have the solution to a convex optimization problem, it's like guaranteed to be the solution to that problem. Moreover, if you start from any initial random guess, you should get to the same correct solution in the end. And in theory, there's, there's bounds on how long this should take. So what this looks like as a convex optimization problem is for every data point, we have this quadratic form inequality. And if you define your optimization variables correctly, um, or the way I did at least, um, you can show that this is linear in those optimization variables. And the optimization variables are basically just the elements of this matrix on the inside. Uh, except for the bottom right corner, C transpose, <laughs> C transpose C is one optimization variable, and A transpose B inverse transpose B inverse A is another optimization variable. So to make this all a complete optimization problem, we're trying to minimize the width of our uncertain model we can frame that as maximizing the log of the determinant of B inverse transpose B inverse. We can provide a constraint on C transpose C's trace to, to like complete the, the optimization to being over the, the model's width because the C transpose C is kind of part of that too. We give it a list of these linear inequalities for every data point. And then for each one of these inequalities, we add to this little fudge factor, the trace of sigma times B inverse transpose B inverse. And all that does is allows the fitting process to ignore data that's dominated by noise. In the end, we get this beautiful result. The identified models with convex optimization are more precise than the models that would come from least squares in the traditional model validation approach. When we look at this Bode plot example, we're looking at the system on the bottom right here, two masses, two springs, two dampers. The dampers are uncertain. We've simulated this system with three different configurations of those dampers. Those are the white lines, they're a little bit hard to see. And from these uh, systems, we've generated a bunch of raw data points. So those are the white dots. The white dot data points don't necessarily need to be inside the two models because of that fudge factor that allows it to ignore data that's basically noise. And then what you're looking at is a much tighter identified model, a much tighter a convex optimization model. I guess they're both identified than the least squares model. So that felt great. Moving on, I've uh, 
been able to apply, uh, or I've worked on some other problems within this, this challenge of human modeling and estimation, and they're, they're kind of cool. So first, we, we continued working on that uh, ARM test bed and tried to model kind of what humans look like when they're in feedback. And we got this model first in the frequency domain, and later we found a good realization of it in the time domain that looks like an inefficient spring. So if you think about deflection and torque plot here, you go up on one curve and it takes a lot of torque. And then when you try to get your energy back, you get less energy back. That's an inefficient spring. We've also been able to show that these models can be tracked. Well, I guess I shouldn't really say tracked because we added other sensors. And these sensors, sorry, Slack notifications. These sensors um, allowed us to come up with an artificial intelligence predictor for the stiffness of the human joint. And then this allowed us to do a little bit of robust control online and redesign the controller to constantly change the performance based on what the humans, uh, what stiffness the human was exhibiting at the time, which allowed us to improve our controller performance. And the last one's also pretty cool. We have this ankle exoskeleton system. I guess it's a little hard to see the ankle exoskeleton, but it's there. Um, and we are walking on the Michigan wave field here. And as we're walking, we have a state estimator that knows what walking looks like. Um, it's got a very simple model. The stride completion goes up with time. There's a rate component to that. And then there's also two other parameters, the ramp and the stride length. And those parameters can be inferred live based on how they change the gate model that predicts the sensor measurements. And the sensor measurements here are the foot angle and the shank angle. So this allows us to provide a level of terrain adaptive control. We can see what the human's doing, what, how the human's pattern is changing in real time, and we can update our control profile to match. So my vision for future work in human modeling and estimation, uh, one component of it takes that idea and applies it to people with limb loss. Um, if you're watching somebody walk with a prosthesis and you begin to see a compensation behavior, I think it should be possible to map that compensation behavior to what it's compensating for. Mapping, for example, the, the swinging of the leg out wide, which is a compensation for avoiding obstacles like this Lego castle on the floor here, you could map that to lifting up the robotic knee of a prosthesis and allow the person to have direct control over this thing that they otherwise wouldn't. There's another interesting area of research in finding models of human behavior that aren't tied to specific human joints. A multi-dimensional model of, of how the human interacts with the robot, like you could see with this uh, arm robot, um, using a bunch of joints wouldn't be a very clear model. You wouldn't even necessarily be able to measure what the, the joint angles are to try to use the joint impedances to construct the output mechanical impedance. And even if you did, you wouldn't necessarily know all the joint interrelationships that are going to be tied to what the final end effector impedance of the human is here. So I think that models of this type would enable unmatched robot kinematics to be handled more gracefully. And in the, in the domain of uncertain modeling, I think there's a great opportunity here to take that a convex optimization approach to finding models and apply it online, live to, to modeling the human's uncertain behavior. And the, the core concept here is that if you had some controller for your robot that depended on a robust model of the human and the model was wrong and the human and the robot together started to vibrate, you could use that vibration as evidence that your model is wrong. You, I mean, now you have basically a sinusoidal signal where you've got an input and an output from your human. That's like a new data point in the convex optimization framework. You could give that to your convex optimization problem and tell it to fix the model. Moving on a little bit more, there is that last challenge, system integration and control. So I have a story 
about power steering. I was driving a car that had a questionable electrical system and one day it turned off on the highway. And at that moment, I realized just how great power steering always was. Power steering is easy to not realize uh, because it's so perfect. When you manipulate the wheels of your car, you don't even know how much they really weigh. They weigh a surprising amount, um, as I found out, you know, frantically steering the regular way. I think this is kind of a, a goal for human interactive robots. If they're trying to amplify strength, there is a possibility that they could go beyond the level where humans can tell that it's even happening. Um, that would be really, to me, the goal of all of this is to, is to make these systems as reliable as power steering, where you wouldn't know exactly how much work it was doing until it failed. And uh, so, so here I've got power steering on the right, and then the human on the left, uh, in particular here, I'm, I'm describing uh, a powered orthoprosthesis system where just a single degree of freedom is being amplified. And it's almost the same problem as power steering. There's, there's like a sensor you can easily use. You can put it between the prosthetic socket and the passive prosthesis of this person. And you can use that to measure what they're doing to the steering wheel. And use that to strengthen their hip. That's the assistance part. And uh, by doing this, I, I feel like we've got the simplest case. And so what's, what's the challenge of system integration and control? It's to, it's to get every level of this system up to the quality where it can achieve these high level goals of you know, fooling the human into thinking they're just stronger than they really are. I worked on a lower body exoskeleton um, where we had similar challenges to this. Um, and I wanted to go through uh, how this project worked. So the, the goal here was to amplify human strength as perceived by this force sensor between the exoskeleton backpack and the backpack component that the human wore, which we considered part of the human. And this is all with respect to lifting unknown payloads on the person's back. This is kind of like a really simple example of manipulation, except that you wouldn't actually normally manipulate stuff with your back other than to carry unknown payloads. Exoskeleton's dynamics looked a lot like a humanoid robot with a floating base um, in the generalized coordinates Q. So we've got a mass matrix, an acceleration vector, a Coriolis term, a gravity term. We've got an underactuated exoskeleton that can't affect the floating base joints. And moreover, it can't affect four of the joints which were mechanically passive on this thing. So this underactuation matrix you know, prevents the torque from affecting some degrees of freedom. It's got a human interaction force and Jacobian. It's got a ground reaction force in Jacobian and it has an external load. And the ground reaction force is resolved from a ground contact constraint based on which feet are on the ground at the time. One of the key problems we had to solve to get this whole integrated system to work is how to deal with the fact that controllers for floating base robots need to have contact constraints. And those contact constraints kind of determine how the robot can distribute forces into the ground. And if you give the robot a contact constraint for both feet, then what's to stop the robot from deciding to accomplish your task by splitting the weight evenly between the two feet? What we needed to do was to allow the human some degree of control over this internal force of multi-contact, the, the, the force between the two feet, you could say, rotation between the two feet, all these internal forces of multi-contact needed ultimately to be determined by how the human was resolving the weight between their two feet in order to allow the human to release contact slowly so that they could so that the the robot put no no weight on a foot in anticipation of the human lifting that foot off the ground and the way we did this is by defining a virtual foot that slid between the two feet of the robot and you can see this in this goofy little uh, rviz visualization here on the bottom 
it starts off on the left, and then as the person transitions, the contact moves to the right. We penalize errors in our framework. So we couldn't just say, use this virtual foot. What we really said is there is a 12 degree of freedom vector of ground reaction forces. Six of them are explained by the virtual foot model, six degrees of freedom worth. And the other six we defined as the inner foot force task that the robot tried to drive to zero. And the way this robot dealt with these uh, multiple contacts is in this whole body control formalism of prioritized tasks. And at the top of the priority list, there were fundamental torque limits. Below that, we had some constraints to avoid letting the exoskeleton slide the forces or slide the feet relative to the ground. We wanted to make sure the exoskeleton obeyed a friction cone constraint. The inner foot force task was number three on the list. And number four was strength amplification, which briefly is to say that the, the exoskeleton tried to figure out how much weight the, the added mass was putting on the human and compensate for some fraction of that. And last, there were hip forces that were outside the sagittal plane. And the strength amplification task, to be clear, was only really in the sagittal plane. Now, if you've worked with lexicographic optimization, you might be aware that it is kind of slow because to solve it properly, you really have to solve a bunch of optimization problems. First, you optimize for the first priority, then that's a constraint, and you have to optimize for the second priority. And that would take too long for us to or achieve uh, real-time control. So we had this clever solution of using a one-norm approximation of the lexicographic optimization. And what this meant is we chose a cost function that happens to result in perfectly zero errors for a lot of the tasks. And perfectly zero errors means that those tasks have been prioritized over the other tasks. And by setting the weights to be sufficiently unequal, we were able to achieve the lexicographic priority list we wanted using this much, much faster approach to actually setting up an optimization problem. So here's a quick video of how this looked. You can see the hips shaking side to side sometimes. That's kind of the lowest priority task being violated when the constraints prevent it from, from working. On my screen, you, you may have seen briefly that RVIS visualization of the, the ground reaction forces. The exoskeleton was able to go upstairs. And uh, bless presenter mode, give me a second. Sorry about that. And uh, the amplification behavior worked. When we look at the sagittal plane torque the human is experiencing. When the exo is unpowered, it's quite large. When the exo turns on gravity compensation, it goes back down towards zero. When we add the additional unknown weight, it goes back up. And then when we add the amplification, the human effort is again reduced. That was the goal and it was achieved. Just briefly mention some other uh, uh, control and integration contributions. I've worked on um, adding handhold capability to the, the multi-contact optimization problem for the DARPA virtual robotics challenge at IHMC. I've worked on reducing time delays in complex um, computer code systems for real-time Linux. And recently I've started working uh, with, with Dr. Greg on models based off of uh, energy shaping, which is to, to have the high level controller be based off of simple sagittal plane dynamics, where relative to the original model of those dynamics, 
the controller tries to enforce another set of dynamics, which allow the human an easier time to move the exoskeleton system. I was able to use that framework to reject ground reaction forces and kind of simulate the same strength amplification behaviors without the optimization problem. And we were also able to allow multitask controllers that are based off of optimization to go a little bit beyond uh, passive behavior in order to improve performance. So my vision for strength amplification control going forward is to start with simple single degree of freedom actuation uh, applications where we could, for example, that orthoprosthesis I mentioned earlier and really nail them. Then move on to tool frame amplification for more humanoid robots and then approach the, the full multi degree of freedom amplification that would require the new sensors for interaction with the environment. So that altogether is my vision for human controlled robots to solve these fundamental problems. I want to look at high bandwidth design for sensing and uh, design challenges. Um, I want to research human modeling and estimation so we know what the human is doing and how that is changing over time. And I want to research strength amplification control in various formats and solve the high level integration challenges necessary to make these systems feel like they're essentially working perfectly. Thank you.